How's everybody tonight? I think I'm good too. Let's um, let's pray, and then we will begin. Father God, we just thank you for this time we can be gathered together. Lord, we ask that your spirit would be with us. Lord, that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word. Prepare us, uh, encourage us in worship, Lord God. Uh, we pray that as we, uh, as we sing, Lord, that we would be ascribing value unto you. For indeed, God... You are worthy of our praise. So we just lift this time to you. We pray that you would be with us. And we give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So <clears throat> we're going to be doing, starting next week, we're going to be doing some new things on, on Wednesday night. Some of the uh, high school, junior high kids are going to join us for worship and a time of teaching. And then afterwards, we're going to have something every week. Wednesday night for family. So whether that's, I don't know, fire out there that we are roasting marshmallows over or volleyball game in the grass or there will be some event after church since we're into summer now and <clears throat> weather's nice, uh, at least today. And uh, so so um, if you would uh, pray about that and be a part of that with us, uh, we would truly enjoy getting to know one another and spending time with one another. So it's pretty much the goal to try to see the church being the church. We get used to doing this thing where we just all come together and sit down and listen to me talk. And that's cool, but that's the church is more than that. That's, that's just a little part. So we hope to encourage uh, development of relationships and stuff through some family time. So um, we look forward to that. Kicking off next week, <clears throat> we're gonna. I'm gonna do a, a new song. Um, it's, well, it's not new, but it's new to y'all. Um, I don't know. I think it's written by the Gettys, but um, it is a song uh, from the 130th Psalm. Uh, it's from an, an album by Shane and Shane called Psalms, and. Um, so I wanted to read the 130th Psalm so uh, you would see that. And uh, as we worship, um, that you would recognize that one of the cool things about worship is singing the Word of God. It is uh, pretty encouraging for us. So let me read that to you. Hundred and thirtieth Psalm is a song of ascent. It says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, would mark iniquity, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, for he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. I cry to you In darkest places I will go Incline your ear to me anew Hear me cry for mercy, Lord Were you to count my sin 
How could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze. I stand redeemed by grace alone. I will wait for you. I will
open our ears that we might hear your truth that your word would penetrate our hearts God and bring forth a mighty harvest we thank you Lord that you are our salvation and we thank you Lord that uh, we stand here waiting for you we give you praise and glory in this place in Jesus name Amen. Is it hot in here? Hey, anybody know an air conditioning guy we can get to go turn the air conditioning on? <clears throat> oh, hi, Robin. <laughs> I don't know if it's just me, <clears throat> but I am warm. Menopause. It could be. My wife says that's a real thing, so. All right, we're going to be in Ezekiel chapter 22. And Ezekiel 22, if you remember, we're on our way through, we have several oracles dealing with uh, God's judgment on Jerusalem to given to the people in the refugee camps because, remember, they still think that because um, they're in the refugee camp, that means they're the ones being judged by God, and the ones in Jerusalem are the holy guys. And God spends 20, nearly 24 chapters telling them that's not true. Now, I'm sure you and I, we, we learn our lessons when the Lord is speaking and moving in our lives quicker than that. I'm sure maybe you guys do. I know that I have not always um, heard and responded to God's direction like I should have. So we find ourselves... Tonight, with three oracles, three separate oracles, Ezekiel's going to give, again, to the refugees. And as we go through them, I, I just, uh, you know, just it's, for me, it's kind of like when we, when we did Jeremiah. I have a hard time doing Ezekiel and not seeing parallels to our nation, to our time, to the things that are going on in our world, uh, to the reality that, uh, um, I, you know, to me, the Lord is speaking to the church and it's high time for us to awake out of sleep for now his return is nearer than when we first believed and the goal for us is not just to stand by the Lord never said hey you know what just just put your hands in your pockets and stay home I'll come get you later he challenged us right he's given us a commission Something that we're supposed to be doing. And when Jesus told his parables, you remember how many of his parables started with, so the master went away and he returned for the steward to give account of what he had done. The steward of the house. Whether it's the parable of the talents, the parable of the minas, there's multiple parables where Jesus uses this formula to say, hey, there's a... There is a way that we're supposed to respond to a culture that is rejecting Christ all around us. And we can learn those lessons by looking at a point when God removed his people, his elect, where God took them out. The elect, gone. They would boast, we're the elect of God. Yeah. Yeah. That won't get you anywhere. And so we're, we see that as we look at these first 24 chapters of Ezekiel. So tonight, Ezekiel 22, we start. Oracle 1 is the oracle of the bloody city. Oracle of the bloody city. And the word of the Lord came to me and said, And you, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city and declare to her all her abominations? So this is the oracle uh, against the bloody city, and it is her indictment. This is the indictment of Jerusalem. Now, you know, guys, we've talked about this before, Ezekiel's prophecies did no good to the people in Jerusalem. 
No Facebook. No Facebook Live, no YouTube. So Ezekiel's telling refugees. In about three chapters, we're going to see the refugees from Jerusalem, the last batch, come. And all the things Ezekiel's been saying over the, the, his time in the refugee camp is going to be uh, upheld. And they will know there is a prophet among us, right? Then they will know for a certainty. So he said in verse 3, You shall say, thus says the Lord God, a city that sheds blood in her midst. Here's her indictment, the indictment of Jerusalem. A city that set, sheds blood in her midst so that her time may come. And that idea, so that her time may come, is that she is speeding along God's judgment. She's speeding along God's judgment by the shedding of innocent blood. And that shedding of innocent blood covers everything you can imagine. In essence, he's calling the city of Jerusalem a violent place. What, what, what does the world say about the U.S.? Or you ever watch the news lately of the peaceful protests? It's amazing what we can call peaceful nowadays, Right? Of course, if the political view is different, they're insurrectionists, but, but everything else is peaceful while the buildings are burning down around you. The charge, the indictment is the city's violent. And you remember, we go back to Genesis, there was a murder in the very beginning. You remember, brother against brother? And what did the Lord say? Cain, your brother's blood cries out to me. How many were dead? One. So, can you imagine the tumult in the ears of Almighty God to bring judgment? When we don't see God's judgment, we don't, we're not reading, you know, uh, Revelation. We, we don't see the things of Revelation occurring in our streets. We should cry out to God and give him praise for his mercy. Because that's not what, that's not what is deserved. So, one, there's blood in your midst. Two, she makes idols to defile herself. So the two points that he makes, she's violent and unfaithful. So the city of Jerusalem is violent and unfaithful. So he's going to deliver a summons, like a court summons, through Ezekiel. Here, is the, here are the indictments laid out as a summons. You have become guilty by the blood that you have shed. And defiled by the idols that you have made. And you have brought your days near. The appointed time of your years has come. So we see, you've heard me talk about it before, but you, when we read through the prophets, we remove ourselves historically from 490 years of mercy. Bad king after bad king, wicked thing after wicked thing, destruction after destruction after destruction, all this rebellion against the Lord God. You're looking at all of this and God being merciful, being merciful, being merciful. Now he says, yeah, that's it. I'm done. The, the, your appointed time has come. So the time of God's judgment. The ending, for all intents and purposes, of the monarchy of, of Israel, the line of David's going to stop until Messiah. Uh, kings are going to... Uh, not arise again, you're going to have uh, puppet kings placed on thrones by other powers until the time of Christ. Herod is not of the line of David, right? Everybody knows that? So when we, when we look, uh, the rightful king, there's, there's only one. There's only one. Yeshua. Ha Mashiach. Yeshua the king. The Messiah. The anointed one of God, king of kings, Lord of lords, the one who is to come. So he says, look, your appointed time has come. Mercy has been extended. So I know when we, we read the prophets and we're like, destroy, 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 destroy. I love it because atheists do this all the time. I was watching. I don't know why I do it. I just do it to, to raise my blood pressure sometimes. I was watching a guy who had a response to uh, someone I don't consider to be a very grounded teacher anyway, and he had a response against this guy, and so he's throwing out all these verses to talk about 
the reality of the Bible not being, uh, uh, can't be authoritative. It's not a good ground for morality. And, and of course, they just pull Bibles out willy-nilly, verses out willy-nilly, and they throw it down. And I, and I want to say, you know, before you can quote out of Second Kings, you've got to read the rest of the books before it. You've got you to gotta go through the history, just like you would do anything else. You know, I'm sure he would be upset if, if, if I just uh, quoted from uh, Richard Dawkins one line out of one of his books and didn't, wasn't honest to the context around it, right? So, interestingly, I do this just to frustrate myself, but, but as we look at it, the, don't disconnect yourself from the mercy of God. God has been way more merciful than you or I would be. 500 years of mercy is longer than any of you are going to live. No matter how old you feel today, you're not going to make 500 years. Forgiving a group of people who have consistently committed the exact same sin against you. So when Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? You remember what Jesus said? Seventy times seven, which is how much? 490, the exact amount of years that God gave mercy to Israel for the same sin. So we, we have God's mercy, but now he's saying, mercy's up. Mercy's up. It's time. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations and a mockery to all the countries. Those who are near, those who are far from you will mock you. Your name is defiled, and you are full of tumult. Is there another way you would describe us today? Is our name not defiled? What about, is there a tumult? Is our, is our current world, you know, looking at the U.S., is, are we full of tumult? We fight over everything. Mask, no mask. Vaccine, no vaccine. All of this. The Lord said specifically for Jerusalem, that was his judgment on them. His judgment on them for their wickedness of violence and unfaithfulness. Now he goes on and he gives the presentation of his evidence in verse 6. Behold, the princes of Israel in you. So now he's going to talk about the leadership. Well, I'm sure we won't find any parallels here. Behold, the princes of Israel in you. Everyone according to his power have been bent on shedding blood. Mother and father are treated with contempt in you. The sojourner, uh, the, the sojourner, the, the foreigner suffers extortion in your midst. The fatherless and the widow are wronged. So the point is, all of these abuses are going on under the watchful eye of your leadership. The leadership is not putting a quell to the shedding of blood. In fact, it, if, there's, if there's a better sentence for mother and father are treated with contempt in our nation than what, what uh, Ezekiel is saying here, I don't know what it is. I can't think of one thing I've ever seen in media, on TV, in a movie where mother and father are treated with honor. Most of the time, mom and dad are idiots. And uh, it, it's up to us kids to solve all the problems. And if you think that's not affecting kids, uh, well, you're crazy. Yeah, it's affecting them. If, if you think that's not that doesn't lead to, to the way that they think. The sojourner, the foreigner, it's, it's oppressing, extorting them, taking advantage of them. How many, how many times have we seen or somebody, a foreigner who's opened up, a, let's say they bought a 7-Eleven and they open it up and they're down in New York City and they got to pay protection money so that they can stay open. What do you call that? That's extortion. And the point is they say, all your leaders know what's happening and they're not doing anything about it. If you think that idea is in every movie you've ever seen, but it doesn't really happen, once again, you are off your rocker. These things are occurring. The fatherless 
and the widow are wronged in you. I, I have uh, started going through a, a pretty interesting book that details basically the destruction of the black family as a result of the welfare state and the sexual revolution in the 60s. And it's an old book. It was, it was uh, we think cancel culture's new. This guy got canceled a long time ago when he wrote his book. But, but uh, it's incredible. It was a believer who's seen this stuff coming and said, hey, man, we're, we're going to destroy a, a whole culture of mankind and what has occurred. Uh, people look and they say, why is, it, why is all this lawlessness so rampant? Is there, does any of it go back to fatherlessness, do you think? There are the fatherless and the widow. They are wronged. They are wronged. Your leaders know. You have despised my holy things. The despising of, of God and his holy things. Uh, you can't say uh, anything about a holy day anymore, right? It's, it's got to have a different term. You can't say Merry Christmas because, well... You know, we don't, we don't want to use the name of Christ. So it'll be Merry Xmas or Happy Holidays or Hanukkah might be okay. I don't know. Unless you're in New York where Palestinians are uh, abusing Jews in the streets. So, oh, that, by the way, is these United States. So you despise my holy things, profane my Sabbath. These are men or there are men in you who slander to shed blood. And people in you who eat on the mountains and commit lewdness in your midst. So the idea of lewdness and eating on the mountains is the concept of unfaithfulness, idolatry, and sexual immorality. Those always go together when God talks about unfaithfulness. Idolatry was steeped in sexual immorality. That's why people liked uh, to worship idols. It's a great draw. Hey, I'm going to go worship Baal. That just meant that you were going to go sleep with somebody and celebrate on top of a mountain, eat a meal up there, and, and uh, that pretty much marks some of the attitude of our world. Although they don't acknowledge that they're worshiping idols, they nonetheless are. Sexual immorality is a sin one brings against his own body. So we have these things laid out. They commit lewdness in your midst. In, your, uh, in you, men uncover their father's nakedness. In you, they violate women who are unclean and in their menstrual impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. Another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. So he's just talking about rampant sexual immorality. Rampant sexual immorality. And you need to understand this. When he talks about... Anytime he talks about this phrase, uncovering father's nakedness, is not talking about homosexuality. He's talking about heterosexuality. And, and what Leviticus tells us is uncovering your father's nakedness is anytime you sleep with one of his wives. Which should shed a light on you for what was going on with Noah. And why the curse would fall upon the child that was born. Rather, rather than the one who committed the act. Because oftentimes, incest does not just affect me. The rampant sexual immorality that was going on, God says, look, you, you guys are breaking every sense of, of uh, honor in sexuality that God had laid out in his word. You're breaking it all. Rampant Sexual immorality is defiling. You think that's not happening in a church? Well, okay, maybe we're not, we don't have the level of incest that they have, but you don't understand their culture. You see, when a son wanted to show his authority over his father, and if they were kings, the son would sleep with his father's harem. And that would establish him as the authority. He was saying to his dad, I'm the king now. So the fact that sons did that to their fathers in a plural, a pluralistic marriage society, it should not be shocking to us. That was part of their, their cultural ideas. People have had weird cultural ideas for a long time, no? 
I'm sure one day people will look at us and say, man, those guys had some weird ideas. So we, the point is, it is all in opposition to the clear teaching of God's word. It's not hard to follow God's word, just people don't like to. Right? So the attitude of sexual immorality is part of the judgment that the Lord is bringing. <clears throat> and then he says, uh, in you they take bribes to shed blood. You take interest and profit and make gain uh, of your neighbors by extortion. But me you have forgotten, declares the Lord God. So the idea is, look, you don't care about the poor. You don't care about the suffering. You're apathetic toward God, but you're super focused on making money. Well, you, you wouldn't say that about us. I'm pretty sure that oracle could be read right over the top of Washington, D.C., and the Lord said, at the end of the oracle, he says, but you have forgotten me. What's he saying? Look, I have delivered unto you my word. And my word clearly delineates for you how to color in the lines. And what it is to rebel and go outside the lines. And you guys aren't even trying. I remember still in kindergarten, I, I never knew this was a possibility. I, I you would try so hard to color in the lines. And, and most little boys do not have the coordination that a little girl does, right? So I'd look over at the girl next to me, and her picture's perfect, and she's in the lines. And there's no gaps, and mine has all these gaps. And, and, I'm, and I'm like, doggone it. I don't understand how to do it. And I turn in, and I hated the picture. P teacher put it up, you know, put, it looks dumb. And then I watched the guy next to me, and he's taking his crayon, and he's just going, whoop, 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 just coloring the whole dang paper. And he colored it all, and he got it all, did it all, and then he went and got scissors and cut it out. I told him, that's cheating. You colored outside the lines, but nobody knows, because you cut it out, and your picture looks better than everybody's. I still remember thinking to myself, oh, my goodness, why couldn't I think of coloring outside the lines? The Lord is laying out right now for these people. Man, you guys are just coloring outside the lines. You don't even care. You're not trying to hide it. You're not trying to, you don't recognize it as sin. You don't recognize this as a problem. And that is exactly what's going on in our world today. He goes on, behold, I will strike my hand at the dishonest gain that you have made. Everybody, every one of us knows there's a crash coming. Do we know that? Every one of us knows the crash is coming. Knows the crash is coming. Economic collapse of some sort is coming. The Lord says, I, by my hand, will strike at your dishonest gain that you have made and at the blood that's been in your midst. And then he says, can your courage endure or your hands be strong in the day that I deal with you? God brings judgment. There's nothing nobody's going to do. There no hero will arise. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. In Leviticus 26, there's a couple of sections in Leviticus 26 I wanted to read, and I want to read them for you because of this. These were things God said all the way back at the time of the Exodus. So all the way back, the very beginning of the nation. No kings yet. The Lord gives out in the book of Leviticus the, the directions for his people, right? Before, before there's even a king. Leviticus 26, verse 14, he says, But if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes, if your soul hates my rules, so that you will not do my commandments but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic with wasting disease and fever. It will consume the eyes and make the heart ache. And you will sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. So God says in the beginning, look, you, you abandon me, and I will abandon you. You're unfaithful to me, and I will, I'll turn you over. Because you're enjoying my blessing, 
Everybody enjoys the sun coming up, the warm days, the, the bright sunshine, the great blessings that come from the hands of God. Every good and perfect thing we have comes down for us from our Father in heaven, yes? Everybody enjoys all of that. The Lord says, I'll stop. If you've ever read Revelation chapter 6 through 19, you see what stopping looks like. Verse 15 of Ezekiel 22, he says, I will scatter you among the nations and disperse you through the countries. I will consume your uncleanness out of you. You will be profaned by your own doing in the sight of all the nations while everyone's watching and you will know I am the Lord. In Leviticus 26, drop down in that chapter a little further to verse 33. Here's what the Lord said before there was ever a king. I will scatter you among the nations, unsheathe the sword after you. Your land will be a desolation. Your cities will be a waste. The land will enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate while you are in your enemy's land. The land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it will have rest. The rest that it did not have on your Sabbath when you were living in it. And as for those of you who are left, I will send faintness in their hearts in the lands of the enemies. The sound of a driven leaf will put you to flight. They will flee as one flees from the sword. They shall fall when no one pursues. They will stumble over one another as if to escape a sword. Though none pursues, and you shall have no power to stand before your enemies. You shall perish among the nations, and the land of your enemies will eat you up. And those of you who are left will rot away in the enemy's lands because of their iniquity, and also because of the iniquity of their fathers. They shall rot away like them. Before there was ever a king, the Lord said, I'm telling you all of these things. I'm giving you all these guidelines. So you know where to color. Color in the lines. It does not matter to me. People today want to argue over, uh, are you sure this is what God said? Look, I don't, I don't need to argue over anything. Just do the ones you know. Why don't we just start there? Just do the ones you know. Do you know there are things that are a part of your life that are... That are um, that cause consternation on your Savior? Do you know that you do things that displease him? Well, you don't have to have a reason. Just stop. What did Jesus say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I say? And don't think those things, you know, what, which, which of the Ten Commandments are you going to throw away? Murder? Stealing? Lying? Those aren't going anywhere. Loving the Lord your God, loving your neighbor as yourself. Are you going to throw those away? No. I'm pretty sure Jesus said the law and the prophets hang on these two. Right? So we, we want to walk in obedience to the word that he's given. So thus ends the first oracle. What's our lesson? Here it is. A society that thrives on violence not only self-destructs, but will also have to contend with God. I used to say that the, the number one thing I, I want to be about is violent things. I like to watch violent things, violence. I'm like, hey, that's not bad. I, it's just violent. But God's like, I don't, I don't really like violence. <laughs> and when he brings it, it's for judgment. It's not just random. The second thing is... Community leaders bear a special responsibility to maintain justice and wealth and the welfare of its citizenry. So leaders are also under particular judgment, right? Do they have a job to do? A biblical job? Yeah? God kind of lines out what it's supposed to look like. Finally, the knowledge of the will of God is not a substitute for obedience. I know what your word says. Oh, that's nice. Now do it. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. Love your brother. 
please your Father in heaven. That's not what we do as a nation. That's not what we do. That's not who we are. I bet I can go home tonight, turn on the news, and watch brother punching brother in the head. I'm not talking about boxing either. I'm talking about someone's protesting somewhere, throwing something at somebody else, right? Oracle 2 is the oracle of the furnace of God's wrath. You guys have heard of the refiner's fire? Well, here's a little example of the refiner's fire. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. All of them are bronze, tin, and iron, and lead in the furnace. They are the dross of silver. You notice none of the people did he say was silver. In this refiner's fire, this is not the one where he's going to skim off the dross and purify them. They are the dross. So the Lord is purging his people of the dross. And the dross is in Jerusalem. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have all become dross, therefore, behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. Just in case you were doubting, it was Jerusalem. I will gather you in the midst as one gathers silver and bronze and iron and lead and tin into a furnace to blow the fire on it in order to melt it. So I will gather you in my anger and in my wrath and I will put you in and melt you. I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath and you shall be melted in the midst of it. As silver is melted in a furnace, so you shall be melted in the midst of it and you shall know that I am the Lord, I have poured out my wrath on you. He doesn't take them out of the furnace. They just burn up in it. It is a oracle of complete destruction. He will strike them in his wrath. They have lost their value to God. The elect of God are not the elect of God now. The elect of God as a nation, the nation of Israel, the Lord is saying, nope, you're dross. I am going to burn you up. No silver is present. They are left in the furnace. The point is, the lesson of this oracle is this. The image of the refinery turns upside down Israel's view of herself as Yahweh's prized possession. We are God's chosen people. The Lord would never destroy us. That's not what the word teaches, is it? The Lord said, you are dross. Where is he going to bring his remnant from? The refugee camp where Ezekiel is. Where Jeremiah is back in Jerusalem, nobody ever listened to him, did they? Nobody ever listened. The king said, just finally tell me the truth. What's going to happen? And he said, I've been telling you. Surrender and you'll live. Fight and you'll die. What did the king choose to do? He tried to run away. The armies were out there. He dug a little hole in a wall tried to run away. And he got caught. And he went back to Babylon blind and sunless. Right? Oracle number three. The un manned breach so the point here is your officials the leadership of the nation have brought upon you the wrath of God the, the God charges leaders with especially in Israel what, what was it that every king was supposed to do he was to take the book of the law and read it and make his own copy not just that he would read it so that he could say I have read it all but then he was to make his own copy so that he would know what God's requirement was. And you know, at the time of Josiah, nobody had a Bible in all of Israel. They stumbled upon the scrolls in the temple. Some even say that the one who found them was Jeremiah's father. And he took them to Josiah the king. And Josiah read them and tore his cloak, and the last revival to hit Israel occurred. Because a leader of Israel 
understood the value of repentance. It's kind of an important concept. And he called the people to repentance. And he tore down the, the sites of their unfaithfulness, the high places. In Zephaniah, Zephaniah was a prophet at the same time. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Zephaniah is one of the minor prophets. Not because he's just minor, just means his book is short. Minor prophets have short books. Uh, major prophets have long ones. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 3 writes this. Speaking of Jerusalem, her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They leave nothing till the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy and do violence to the law. That's what the prophet Zephaniah was saying. Zephaniah 3.8, he says, Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I will rise up and seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, assemble kingdoms, pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger for the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. Peter writes something about that, don't he? All the earth shall melt with, how's it go? Fervent heat, yeah, yeah, you guys have heard it before, right? So here is the oracle of the unmanned breach, Ezekiel 22, 23. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say to her, you are a land that is not cleansed or rained upon in the day of indignation. You are not clean. God's first charge on the land of the unmanned breach, you, your guilt is upon you. Now, there was a means by which they could have been cleansed, but not in rebellion against God. There's no means by which you can be cleansed then. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. Sound familiar? Zephaniah, you know, when the Holy Spirit's moving through two people, they can sound an awful lot alike. It's like a, lo a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured human lives. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. So he's saying, look, the conspiracy of your leaders, the people who are supposed to guide you, the, the prophets who are supposed to tell you, what's the point of a prophet? The point of a prophet, we get this wrong still today. The point of a prophet has nothing to do with the future. The point of the prophet was to speak God's word. What did the Lord say? A prophet could hear of the voice of the Lord from a visitation from God, or he could pick up, Jeremiah could pick up Isaiah and prophesy. How, what would he have to do? Read Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, right? That's what prophecy is. So these prophets, they're, they're making up their own message. Is that, that don't happen today, right? There's no prophets who would make up their own message. No, surely not. He goes on, verse 26. Her priests have done violence to my law, have profaned my holy things. They make no distinction between holy and common. Neither have they taught the difference between unclean and clean, and they disregard my Sabbath. See the plural. They disregard my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. Usually every argument I get in with somebody who is uh, um, uh, like a seventh-day person want, want you to worship on the Sabbath, um, that's the only one they want to talk about. That's not the only one God talked about. The Lord also talked about Sabbath years. Six years worth the land. We just read it in Leviticus, right? If you don't give the land a rest, I'm going to kick you out of the land and let the land have a rest. So he said, look, you're, you, you work the land six years, seventh year, the land rests. You don't get to work it. That was, that was one of the Lord's Sabbaths. Do you also know, here's an interesting thing I was challenged with recently and, that concerns the Sabbath. Um, it is pre-fall and pre-law. The Lord created for six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. That's before the fall, right? Jesus 
is our Sabbath rest, right? He fulfills the ritual requirement of the Sabbath, but does man still, should man still take a rest? How come we don't? I'll tell you, you got a buck to make. And I make more money if I work seven days than if I work six, don't I? Paul would even say, I don't care what day you take. Some like Monday, some like Tuesday, some like Sunday, some like this day, some like that day. I remember a time when I was a kid when all the stores closed on Sunday so people could go to worship and families would be together. Where are families now? Shredded, no? Yeah. Hmm. Now, I'm not talking about we got to worship on Saturday, but I'm just saying, is the concept of taking a day of rest something that is a part of creation? Would seem like, no? Would seem like it's, it's there. So the Lord's saying, look, you haven't done, you haven't, you've disregarded them all. No Sabbath, the land's not resting, you're not resting, you're not honoring me. My priests, these are his priests. They're the ones supposed to know, right? So he says, I am profaned among them. Her princes, the leaders, in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey. Oh, that sounds like Zephaniah, right? Uh, shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain. Do, do the politicians care about helping the people? Or do the politicians care about a position and power? Um, there may, there's a couple. I'm not going to say none, right? But in large part, I have a hard time believing you've been in Washington, D.C. as a politician for 40 years plus, And I look at my nation, I think, what in the world have you been doing for 40 years? They're destroying lives to get dishonest gain. Her prophets have smeared whitewash for them. For who? For the leaders. The prophets are whitewashing for the leaders to cover up. All their stuff. He's whitewashing for them, saying they see false visions, divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord when the Lord has not spoken. Ever been any of that going on? Verse 29, the people of the land have practiced extortion, committed robbery, oppressed the poor and needy, extorted the sojourner without justice, the visitor to your land, the immigrant. So listen to what the Lord says. So I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me. God's saying, I'm coming to judge and I'm looking for a man to stand in the breach. Now, think about that for a minute and go back with me to the book of Genesis and the Bible says Abraham was looking at his tent and he saw three men walking across the back of his field and he rushed out to them and he said, stay here and I'll, 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 I'll kill a goat and he's going to feed him a, a meal. And it ends up being the Lord and two angels, right? And the Lord says, should we tell Abraham what we're going to do? Ah, oh, We should tell him. We should tell him. We're going to go destroy Sodom. And Abraham said, Lord, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And the Lord said, no. What do you mean? Well, what if there's 50 righteous? Will you destroy the city? What did God say? No. 40, 30, 20, 10. Now come back to what we're reading in Ezekiel. I sought for a man among them who could build a wall between the wrath of God and his judgment being poured out on the people. And I found none. Therefore I poured my indignation out upon them. I consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord. None righteous. There was none there. None who would stand. I promise you, if there would have been somebody and he stood up, the people would have wanted to kill him. 
Would have made for a good story though, right? Ultimately, as the Lord looks at the world, there's no one to save. So the one who stands in the gap, his name is Jesus. He saves. To what's our lessons in this final one? The call to leadership is not a call to privilege. Husbands, the call to leadership is not a call to privilege. It's a call to responsibility. Not privilege. Well, sometimes we miss that. You go out in front of the church, you're not going to find a parking place in the front that says my name on it. It's not privilege, responsibility. It's about responsibility. And whatever responsibilities other leaders have, the leaders in the house of God have greater responsibilities in sanctifying the Lord God. That means making him holy, showing God holy. And the last one I have here, the survival of the church depends on the response of leaders to the call to stand in the gap. Well, Jesus has brought us salvation, but the judgment day will come for our nation. And the ability to forestall God's judgment depends on we in the church, not them outside. It's us. Until the Lord call us home, right? I want to follow the example of Jesus. Did Jesus stand in the gap for me? Stood in the gap for you? And then he turned around and he said to me, Hey, Jackie, come follow me. Take up your cross daily. Follow me. The oracles of Ezekiel right before the days of a fallen Israel. A lot of foreshadowing there, it seems to me, for you and I. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we thank you for this time. We can be gathered here for the opportunity to study your word, to see, God, what your, your word is challenging us, God, and and I pray, Lord, as we look, we don't just go, well, these are lessons for men long dead and gone. But may we recognize they are lessons for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says that these things that happened to those men long ago happened for our admonition upon whom the end of the age has come. So God, may we respond. May we not be like those who were deafened to the tone of the, of the prophets in the days of old, but may we rather be men and women who are prepared to respond. May we be those who hear your cry and are challenged by the word that says, I'm looking for someone to stand in the gap. There are ways we can sanctify the Lord God in our heart and be prepared always to give a defense for the hope that is within us. So God, be glorified in we, your people, as we respond to your word in Jesus' name. Amen.
mercies are new every morning. So God, equip us to be the men you're challenging us to be. Equip us to be the people you're challenging us to be. And may we, Lord, follow you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And may you be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.